Hello, and welcome to Slightly Nostalgic. My name is Griff, and we have watched Firefly, Episode 4, Shindig. Alright, this is one of my favorites. This time around, I still liked it a lot, but I did notice a lot of weird little moments here and there. But just to recap the plot really quick, this is the one where... Uh, they go to the party, the fancy party on Persephone, and Kaylee wears the big poofy pink dress, and then Mal gets himself into a sword duel, and all of that happens. It's that one. But anyway, the first weird moment I notice happens right at the beginning. They're playing pool in some dive bar somewhere, and the balls, like, flicker in and out of existence. Like they're playing holographic pool, but why... Would that be a thing? Wouldn't it be cheaper to just have regular pool balls? Like, maybe the novelty of it is fine, but why would this dive bar in the middle of nowhere where criminals go to hang out, why would that have holographic pool that doesn't even work correctly? But we do get another bar fight intro, which makes uh, two out of four so far episodes starting out with a bar fight, and they're the two that I've liked the best so far, so... I think there's a theme here. I don't remember if there's any other notable bar fights in the show. There's a big one in the movie, though, that I'm excited to get to, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. The next weird moment comes later when Inara's in her shuttle, I guess, screening prospective clients on her little tablet screen, and uh, there's, like, the little thumbnails of all of her potential clients, and she's deciding who she's going to... Uh, why, uh, what's the word? Enter into an, an, a business arrangement with? I don't know. The whole companion thing, it, it's confusing to me. It, it, it's actually more confusing now than it was the first time I watched this, but we'll, we'll get into that later. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Anyway, she watches a video of a guy who's like really awkward at first. He's like, if you'll do this honor, if you'll do me this honor, it would flatter my honor or something like that like he's awkward and she just clicks off of it and it's like okay so she's just watching like pre-recorded videos of people who want to partake in her services but then she clicks on atherton and they just start having a conversation just in real time like he's talking to her and she's talking back so it's not pre-recorded so does that mean that she hung up on the first guy? Like, <laughs> this poor guy, it seems really cold of her. Like, he's all nervous, trying to get himself a space hooker, and she's just like, mm, nah, next. Doesn't even say anything to him. Next weird moment comes after Mal makes Kaylee mad by call saying, like, her wearing a pretty dress would be like a sheep walking on its hind legs or something like that. And, you know, she gets understandably pissed off, and everybody kind of agrees with her, except Jane, he's just clueless and doesn't know what's going on. So then the group just kind of splits up. Like, they're in this crowded marketplace on Persephone, and they just split up? Like, aren't they all going the same place? What's go Why would they split up? And then, like, seconds later, Mal and Jane get led away at gunpoint by uh, Badger's men. And do the others, they don't notice? They don't care that this happened? Like, what? what's the deal here? Fast forward again to the actual party. They're showing all the guests arriving one at a time. And something I thought was kind of cool is there's this guy who's checking them in, like making sure they're on the list and admitting them into the party. And he just shouts out their names for each person that comes in. I think that's kind of useful. I'm pretty sure they just do it as a plot device so that later they can have Inara find out that Kaylee and Mal are there. But I thought it was kind of cool. I think everybody should do that. All parties should have an announcer guy telling you who's there. I think next time you have a house party or something, or just like a family get-together, I think you should appoint somebody to stand at the door and just announce everyone. In this same scene, they really go out of their way to show that Inara is really a part of this society, like she belongs here, she's high class like that. So they have her go around and say hi to lots of different people throughout all of it, like she's catching up with old friends and stuff. But it's totally weird because they're all extras, so they don't have any speaking lines. So she's just constantly like saying, hi, how are you? What's going on and all this? And the people just kind of like, just kind of laugh and wave or whatever. Like they don't say anything back. Like, are these people all just really rude? Is she only friends with mutes? I, it's very strange. But anyway, going back to the whole companion thing, this time through, I'm noticing a lot more that it's, it doesn't really make sense. It's not very consistent how companions are portrayed. We're supposed to believe that most people consider them very high class, 
They're very accepted and respected in society, at least on the core planets, uh, amongst wealthy people. And we're kind of led to believe that Mal is an outlier in his distaste for companions and how he just lumps them in the same category as any other prostitute. But we're not really shown that consistently through everybody else's interactions with her, because Atherton clearly just considers her a prostitute, or if not a slave. At one point, Mal actually asks Inara if the other women there are also companions, and she's like, no, most of the other women are not companions. So it's not that common, I guess? Like, wouldn't there be a lot of them there? If it was like a, a really well-respected thing, like rich, respectable people just get companions all the time, wouldn't there be a lot of them at that party? Like, it doesn't really make sense. And maybe it's just a situation where there's a lot of people who do highly respect them and think it makes you more respectable to have a companion, and some people just think of them as common prostitutes and look down on them. And I guess that, that actually makes it more realistic because there's just lots of people with different opinions on it. Anyway, moving on. There's another moment that I've always really liked, but this time I felt a little bit differently about it. It's when the Mean Girl Squad is making fun of Kaylee's dress, and this old man comes by and just like puts them in their place and stands up for Kaylee, and it's like, yeah, get him. And uh, it's nice, but this time it kind of stood out to me that the way he does this, the insult he chooses is just slut-shaming, and it's weird because it has nothing to do with the situation. It, like, how much sex she chooses to have has nothing to do with, that. like, that's not what the problem is here. The problem is that she's being mean to this girl, and just making fun of her dress for no reason, and just being, like, a stuck-up jerk. So, yeah, it's cool that this old man comes in and stands up for Kaylee, but why is that the route they chose to go? Especially... I mean, I know this was a while ago, and the whole idea of slut-shaming just wasn't something that was talked about. I definitely didn't ever think about it until recently. But it's still weird that Joss Whedon, who is this huge feminist, had that in his show. It's not a huge deal. I don't think it's anything to get outraged about or anything. It's just kind of a weird little moment that was like, oh, that I feel differently about that this time. But I did love the scene where Kaylee gets along really well with the dudes. I don't know if they're like the mechanics or whatever, but it's a bunch of guys who know a lot about engines, I guess. And she's over there, like she's found acceptance with them. She's still in her big fancy dress, but she's hanging out with all these bros and like making all these inside jokes with about engines and it's great. It's a great scene. Fast forward again to after the party, after Mal has gotten himself in all this dual trouble, it's the night before and he's stuck in this fancy hotel and Anara comes to visit him. Uh, there's this interesting moment, you know how I was talking before about how a big characteristic of Mal's that I have been noticing this time around is that he is just really inconsistent and he doesn't really stick by what he thinks of himself necessarily. So there's a moment here where Anara just calls him out on this, like he says he's not going to escape. She's trying to help him escape, and he says he's not going to because he never backs down from a fight. And then she's like, yes, you do. You do all the time. And I just thought that was great because it was like, oh yeah, that's what I've been thinking this whole time is that he's just, he doesn't actually do what he says. And then she calls him out again for calling her a whore after starting a fight with somebody defending her honor because he was implying that she was a whore. And it's like, yeah, he, he sort of has his code of honor that he tries to justify to himself, but he doesn't really follow it. He doesn't really make sense. He's not consistent. He's not morally consistent, really. But again, I think that just makes him more believable, and I think it makes him a more interesting character. Back on the ship, there's a really odd scene where Badger is there keeping an eye on the crew, making sure they don't run, and river appears and they all get really nervous because they're like uh oh what's going on what's going to happen if badger finds out that she's a fugitive and is highly wanted by the alliance bad things are going to happen there but she plays it off like copying his accent and pretending to be somebody who's from where he's from and just kind of like putting him down and being really dismissive of him and everything it's 
it's a cool scene. I never really knew what to make of this scene. I didn't care much about it before, but this time, like, I get it. I get why it's there. It's there to show us her intelligence, uh, also to show us Summer Glau's acting skills. Like, that was pretty cool. I, I really overlook how great a lot of these actors are. But anyway, I think this is our first real glimpse into how intelligent River actually is, because up until now, we've just seen her doing crazy things. But she is also, like, before the Alliance made her crazy, she was this incredibly gifted genius. And we see that here where she can think on her feet and just instantly slip into this accent, and she knows exactly how to act to kind of neutralize this threat of Badger, and it's great. It's a great scene. Another great scene for completely different reasons is when Mal wins the duel and he decides to stab the guy anyway. He's like, mercy is the mark of a great man. And then he stabs him. Well, I'm just a good man. He stabs him again. Ah, I'm all right. And then later the guy is like, you didn't have to stab that man. He goes, yeah, I know. It was just funny. And lastly, we don't have anything notable to report on Beard Watch, but on Cargo watch uh, they do get to keep the loot this time they got the cows on their ship it remains to be seen whether they will successfully sell it for a profit I don't actually remember how that goes down so we're gonna have to pay attention to that but that's all I have for you today be sure to watch the next episode if you haven't seen it in a while I'll be making a video on that in a few days uh, the next one is safe so thank you so much for watching I will see you next time okay bye